Hi, everyone. Welcome to the final part of lecture 22. In this segment, we're going to start moving into what we actually know about planets outside of our solar system. We call these planets exoplanets because they're planets, but they're outside of what we know. So for thousands of years, the only planets that we knew about in the universe were the ones in our solar system. And for most of that time, humans have wondered if other stars have planets like the ones in our own solar system. But for most of that time, it has been too difficult to actually find planets outside of our solar system for us to know what the answer to that question was. It turns out that finding exoplanets is very difficult and requires pretty advanced technology. So for example, the way you might originally think about looking for an exoplanet is by taking a picture of a star and looking for something nearby to that star that's a little bit fainter. That's kind of the most straightforward way you might imagine to start looking for a planet. But it turns out that this is very, very difficult to do. The challenge of directly imaging or taking a picture of a planet next to a star is about as hard as taking an image of a firefly that is flying about a meter away from a lighthouse from a distance from Los Angeles to New York. So this is an extremely difficult measurement to make. And for many, many years, it just wasn't practical to do at all. The other thing that makes this difficult is that Earth's atmosphere doesn't help. If you look very closely at a star through our atmosphere, it doesn't move, uh, it doesn't remain steady, it twinkles. That's why you have twinkling stars. That twinkling is actually due to turbulence in Earth's atmosphere that bends the light and causes it to appear to jump around and dance kind of like you're seeing in this image. So this dancing makes it even harder to separate that very, very bright star like a lighthouse from that very, very faint planet like a firefly. It also distorts the atmosphere. So you can see here an image of a crater or two on the moon that are being taken through its atmosphere. And you can see how different turbulent layers in the atmosphere are causing these distortions to this image. So instead, when we look for exoplanets, the most effective methods that we have right now are indirect. Instead of looking to take images of the planets themselves, we look for the effects of planets on the stars that they orbit. So one prominent way historically has been to look for a small wobble of a star as a planet orbits around it. So imagine that you have a star here and a planet orbiting it. In this situation, the star is much smaller than the planet, which is not usually the case, but it doesn't really matter uh, for the purposes of this method, because all that matters is that the planet has some mass and the planet tugs on the star. So when the planet orbits around the star, the star actually orbits a little bit around the planet as well, and it gets tugged back and forth in this smaller orbit. We can measure the motion of the star, and if we see the star moving back and forth, we can infer that there must be a planet orbiting that star that's very slightly tugging it. The way we do this measurement is using something called the Doppler effect. Now, we're probably all pretty familiar with the Doppler effect here on Earth. You can hear it in sound when objects are moving towards you and making noise, and then they start moving away from you. I'm gonna play a movie here of an ambulance coming towards this camera and then going past the camera moving away be careful to look for a change in pitch of the siren as it passes the observer here. So I'm gonna play it right now. So could you tell that the pitch of that siren changed? It went from high pitch to low pitch as it passed the observer. That's because when an object is moving towards you, the pitch of sound from that object appears to be higher than it actually is. And when it's moving away from you, it appears to be lower. This exact same thing happens for light, but instead of changing the pitch of the light, it changes the color. So when you have a star that's being orbited by a planet, it very slightly changes the color of the light from that star. And we can measure that by looking for the color of the very specific absorption lines, the very specific fingerprints of the elements in the star, and seeing if they're very slightly shifted either forward or backwards from where we expect them to be.
This is called the radial velocity method. What we do is we take observations with our telescope of the star at many different times. So we take an observation here when the star and the planet are like this. We take an observation here. We take an observation here and we look for changes in the velocity, changes in the color of the lines of that star that match up with an orbiting planet. This is the method that found the very first planets outside of our solar system and the one that won the Nobel Prize in 2019 for the discovery of a planet called 51 Pegasi b, one of the first planets that we knew about and the one that really launched the entire field of searching for planets outside of the solar system. Now, since these very first discoveries in the 1990s, our knowledge of exoplanets or planets outside the solar system has grown exponentially. Now that we have the technology to make these very precise measurements and we know what to look for, we've gotten very, very good at finding exoplanets. So I'm gonna go through a few of the uh, innovations that have helped us to make this massive improvement in our knowledge of the planets outside of the solar system. So in the early years, from perhaps the mid 1980s to the mid 2000s, most of those discoveries were dominated by discoveries using the radio velocity method, looking for the changing Doppler shift of light as a planet orbited. But in the mid 2000s, a new method started to become more common. This is called the transit method. So the idea here is very simple. All you do is you make measurements of the brightness of a star. So brightness is here on the y axis. And you look for times when the brightness of that star happens to dip. So you get a dimming in brightness every so often. And if you see a dimming in brightness happening regularly, you can infer that there might be a planet orbiting around that star, causing its brightness to change. And if you see it happening over and over and over, you can be pretty confident that there really is a planet going around that star. This method only works in certain cases. For example, when the planet's orbit is lined up just perfectly with our telescopes, that it actually blocks the light of the star. But because the measurements are relatively simple, all you have to do is take images of the star over and over and over again and measure the brightness of the star. It's become very popular and very important to our ability to find planets outside of the solar system. An important characteristic of transiting exoplanets is that the bigger the planet, the more light it blocks. This kind of makes sense, right? So imagine that you're trying to figure out how much light is gonna be blocked by any given planet. It's basically how much of an area of the star is getting blocked. So if you have a larger planet, it will block a larger area of the star and cause us to not see the light from that. So the more area of the planet that there is blocked, the bigger the planet must be. The, and the dimmer, the dimmer the star will become as it goes in front. The way we do transit searches is instead of just looking at the brightness of one star all the time, we can observe many, many stars all at once. We take many images of the sky, look at many, many stars, hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands, even millions, and we look for changes in those brightnesses all at the same time. And you don't need necessarily very sophisticated equipment to do that. This is a telescope called the Kilodegree Extremely Little Telescope. It has discovered 26 planets so far. And the amazing thing about this telescope is that it is not really even a telescope. It's this lens here, which comes off of a DSLR camera. So you don't need a big fancy telescope to make these measurements. What you do need are computer data processing. So this wouldn't have been possible prior to perhaps the 1980s. You need big digital cameras, which also made it more difficult. But now that we have these things in abundance and we have digital camera lenses that we can use uh, to make these measurements, it's relatively straightforward to detect transiting planets with relatively inexpensive hardware. So as the 2000s went on, transit started to become more and more popular. But the biggest effect, the biggest important thing that affected our ability to learn about many, many, many planets, these big jumps here, was the launch of another space mission. So I mentioned earlier how Earth's atmosphere makes it very difficult to make precise measurements of things from the ground. And 
it's the same way for trying to find transits. If you're trying to measure the brightness of a star very precisely, and that star is moving around all the time because the atmosphere is turbulent and causing it to bend the light ever so slightly, then you're going to have a hard time measuring the brightness very precisely. So how do you get around this? The easiest way is to go to space. So if you observe a transit from space, you can get much nicer data. On the left plot here, I'm showing the brightness of a star with a planet orbiting it with data taken from the ground with a telescope in Arizona. You can clearly see this dip in brightness, but if you compare it to what you can get with a telescope in space, in this case, the Hubble Space Telescope, there's basically no noise in this data set. This means that we can find smaller dips in brightness, and therefore we can find smaller and smaller planets. And instead of just looking for giant planets the size of Jupiter, we can start looking for smaller planets the size of Earth if we have a telescope in space. So in 2009, NASA launched the Kepler Space Telescope with the goal of doing exactly this. Kepler is a one meter diameter telescope in space. So its mirror is about three feet across. It was launched into an orbit trailing behind the earth. And its job was essentially to take images of one part of the sky over and over and over again for four years, looking for these very small dimmings of brightness. And Kepler was extraordinarily successful at it. Most of the planets outside of our solar system that we know about today were discovered by Kepler, something like 75% of them. And you can see Kepler's impact in these last years. So here's the launch of Kepler in 2009. It took a few years for NASA and all of the data products to get set to go. But once they were released and once people started taking a look at them, our knowledge accelerated. And you can see these big jumps happening here and here. These are individual papers from the Kepler mission that each reported the discovery of hundreds or even a thousand planets. So Kepler was the main driver of the big leaps in our knowledge in the 2010s. And as a result of Kepler's success, most of the planets that we know about today were discovered by the transit method. Over three quarters of the planets, in fact, that we know of today were discovered by transits, and most of these were discovered by Kepler. Radial velocities still find a lot of planets, but they're secondary in the numbers, the sheer number game at this point. And there are a smattering of other techniques, including the technique of just looking very carefully at stars, looking for faint objects nearby, the direct imaging technique. We'll discuss that more in the next lecture.